Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm really delighted to be able to welcome you all today to this Development Matters seminar with Alvaro Lario, President of the International Fund for Agricultural Development, EFAT. My name is Sarah Hunt, and I work in our Department of Foreign Affairs in, as Policy Director in the Development, Cooperation and Africa Division, also known as Irish Aid. And as you may know, we proudly support the IIEA's Development Matter Lecture Series. This series encourages conversations on a wide range of issues important to global development. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from President Lario in today's very timely discussion titled, Towards a Sustainable and Equitable Food Future, Reshaping Food Systems Around Small-Scale Producers. Before we get into the substance of the meeting, I'm just gonna go through some practical matters. So President Lario will speak to us for 15 minutes or so, followed by a short video message, and then we will have a questions and answer session with you, the audience. For those of you joining online, you'll see the Q&A function on Zoom that you can use to pose your questions. And here in the room, we'll have a roving mic. I would just remind you all that today's presentation and Q&A are on the record and are being live streamed. And finally, everyone is welcome to join the discussion on Twitter, of course, using the at IIEA handle and development matters hashtag. With that explained, let me welcome you here today, President Lario, and thank you for joining us to discuss this critically important issue. As you know better than most, we are talking at a particularly difficult time from the perspective of food and nutrition security. Rural communities are facing exceptional challenges in 2023, more frequent extreme weather events, conflict threatening and disrupting lives and livelihoods, and fiscal pressures creating uncertainty. All of these crises and several others have come together and have severely impacted global food and nutrition security. Ireland is, of course, working to respond to this as we are a long-standing champion of efforts to eradicate hunger and malnutrition. Our international development policy, A Better World, recognizes the central role that agricultural and food systems will play in achieving a sustainable future. In 2021, we committed 800 million over five years to nutrition programming. And in 2022, we pledged a further 50 million to combat child wasting over three years. But of course, to be successful in our efforts to really make progress and reduce food and nutrition insecurity across the world, we need to be working as a part of a global community to effect a sustainable food systems transformation. IFAD has an extraordinarily significant role to play in this work, given its unique identity as both an IFI and a UN agency that specializes in providing support to small scale farmers and rural communities. We are very proud of our partnership with IFAD. There is strong alignment between IFAD and Ireland's priorities, our areas of intervention, and we believe that we can achieve a lot working together. President Lario, you are the right person to be talking to at this moment in time. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, President Lario has been president now for almost exactly a year and has many years of experience in academia, private sector, the World Bank and the UN. He received a PhD in financial economics from the Complutense University of Madrid after completing a Master of Research in Economics at the London Business School and a Master of Finance from Princeton University. President Lario, I'm very much looking forward to your comments and thank you very much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today and very much especially with this sunny day. I really appreciate that many of you have chosen to be today. So that's a trade-off and I I really very much appreciate it. I will be giving a, a short speech and showing a video. So let me perhaps uh, come to the floor and, and uh, thank you to all of those online too. Let me start by thanking the International um, Institute and for European Affairs um, for their kind invitation to participate in this Development Matters lecture series. And it's also a great pleasure to be here in Dublin and, and Ireland as one of the IFAD's founding members has been a valued partner for us over the last 45 years. And it's not surprising given their, their commitment to ending poverty and hunger. And we're very much aligned in many of the, of the themes with which we, we work and, and investing on and in with small people and with small scale producers. Um, before setting the scene for today's discussion, let us take a moment to hear from the small scale producers themselves as they talk about the challenges they are facing. So if we can uh, briefly show the video to, to set the context, thank you.
The frequency of droughts, floods, and other extreme climate events in East and Southern Africa has increased over the last four decades. Smallholder farmers and poor rural people bear the brunt as the rains are unreliable. Like now, we are going to the end of October and there is no rain. And so people are getting hungry because there is no water. This has been caused by deforestation, land degradation, and growing water demand, causing biodiversity loss and loss of livelihoods. Availability and access to water is central to livelihoods and sustainable development. It's becoming increasingly uh, evident, even as climate changes and the impacts of climate change impact our food systems, that uh, the need to invest in nature-based based solutions is, is, is completely overdue. Nature-based solutions are interventions, actions, and policies that enhance the protection, restoration, and management of ecosystems, while contributing to climate adaptation, mitigation, and resilience, as well as social economic benefits. Small-scale farmers, who are the major food producers of the region, are highly dependent on natural capital. And by that, I mean land, uh, on water, on soil facility, um, just to produce food for growing urban settings. Farmers and rural communities are adapting these technologies because they address their needs at the farm level. Francis Njoroge, a young entrepreneur, has installed a water pan to help him care for his three seedlings in his nursery, which he sells to farmers and the rural community in his area. Gerald Juma and Tabitha Wangoi have installed biogas for use in their home. This has reduced the amount of firewood they use and has freed more time for Tabitha Wangoi to spend in the market selling her produce. Utilization of natural resources in the form of underground water and solar energy has contributed in enhancing access to water. Shelmith is one of the 65 households in her community with tap water from a community borehole powered by solar. All of this help farmers adapt to the changing climate while improving productivity without damaging the environment. This knowledge really helps me a lot because I see people around, they have shambas, but they don't make use of them and they are getting hungry and they should not be getting hungry because they have their shambas. It's very important uh, through the different facilities that we have in place, the different co-financing arrangements that we have with the EFAD finance programs to develop financial solutions for a just rural transition that most of the African countries are now very much in need of. Well, um, many times I think uh, images and videos show can showcase much more than any of the words that, that we can have here. And uh, we can see that there are solutions out there. These solutions many times require access to finance, access to land, access to technology, access to water, access to inputs. So um, the solutions are there. Right now it's a matter of really of, of investments. And for us, the key issue is actually how to support many of these communities in transition from subsistence farming to really commercially viable farming, where many of them can generate a, a certain income. And this income many times uh, really uh, translates into a better future for children in terms of schooling, also translates into a better nutrition and many times changes the entire communities and the nutrition component of these communities. We know the figures that are out there. I'm not going to repeat it once more. We know that there's more than 700 million people facing hunger, 3 billion people who cannot afford healthy diets. This is well known. Uh, however, uh, we keep uh, seeing that the food systems are still failing us, and we see, see that the investments are not coming where they should be coming. When we talk about food systems, we are talking about uh, how food is produced, but also how food is distributed, how food is commercialized, how food is stored, how food is transported, how food is commercialized. So there's many components actually to, to food. And a lot of the jobs that are created in these rural areas are not only on-farm jobs, but also off-farm jobs. 
and the potential is huge. We know that, for example, only in Africa every year, there's more than 10 million young women and men who are coming to the market and less than 4 million new jobs available. So the gap and the needs are, are really massive. At the same time, there's also a huge connection with climate change. We know that a, a part of the greenhouse emissions is also coming from, from agriculture and very much from uh, bigger farms. And that's also something that we need to take into consideration. The more I, I speak to many of the leaders around the world, the more I'm seeing the the focus on food sovereignty, the focus on not being vulnerable to the local value chains, and the need very much to invest in food security. And I think the link between food security, food systems, agriculture, as well as climate change is getting stronger and stronger. Um, let us perhaps now reflect a little bit on some of the challenges and the key facts out there with the relationship of poverty, food security, and, and food systems. We know first that most of the world's hungriest people live in the rural areas of developing countries. So actually, poverty and food security relates uh, more than 80% to rural areas. Second, most depend on small-scale agriculture. We know that, for example, in Asia and in Africa, more than 70% of the uh, products and of, agri of the food that they consume are being produced by small-scale farmers. And we know also, third, that more than 3 billion rural people rely on, on small farms for their food. At the same time, we are seeing, and especially throughout the crisis, that many of these small farmers are also the ones that are actually going hungry, which is also an, an additional challenge that we have. At the same time, the reality throughout the world, and as I said many times, these food systems are not serving the people who are producing the food, is that we are also seeing escalating conflict. And many times uh, we don't know whether actually hunger is driving the conflict or conflict is driving increased hunger. We are also seeing forced migration. And in many of these rural areas, little opportunities to choose from. Many times the alternative is really getting fast cash in the illegal extract mining industry. Other times it's joining terrorist groups in certain areas of the world. So many of the families which go hungry have to decide between very, very challenging options. So how, how did we come up and in this situation? Not only ending, but not changing it much over the last two, three decades. The reality is that the figures have been coming down in terms of poverty, not for the last three, four years. As you all of you know, we have come back to the 2015 figures when we set up the SDGs. So actually, in the middle road to 2030, we have come back to the same figures. At the same time, the reality of how we ended up here has been not the crisis of Ukraine, not a specific, I would say, uh, shock, not only climate change, but actually underinvestments. When we're talking about food system transformation, we're talking about 300 to 400 billion of needed investment. And uh, for a long time, food systems have been underinvested. And I always put this example, but it was shocking to me during the crisis after when we had COVID and, um, and also during the Ukraine war, the response of the G7 to this was a 5 billion investment. So clearly this is not enough and this will not transform uh, food systems. So um, how, does, how do, for example, small-scale farmers fit into this? Well, agricultural research has tended also to neglect small-scale farmers and how markets do not really work for them. A research commissioned by Oxfam has estimated that small farmers receive only 6.5 cents out of every dollar of value that the food they produce. And we know that many times this is not enough for them to, to lead decent lives. So this is also something that also uh, puts the, the, the focus on what do they get many of these small farmers out of the value chains. Also, if we talk about global climate finance, we also know that small-scale farmers receive less than 2% of the overall climate finance. And we know how they are the ones who are very much uh, impacted. The question I receive in some parliaments many times is why should we care about farmers beyond our borders? And this is a fair question in terms of uh, tax value uh, and uh, tax uh, payers' money. Well, first of all, we know that, uh, and this is very clear, especially after the, the COVID uh, crisis and, and also the, the Ukraine war, that we are very much all connected and we are seeing climate extreme weather events having repercussions all over the world. So the environmental impact in terms of land or water usage is not limited to one individual field or one region. And uh, small-scale farmers, we know that in order to 
avoid a lot of the consequences and increase humanitarian assistance uh, over time, which is what has happened over the last decades, they need to be fairly and decently compensated for the work they do. In the case of small farms, why are they important? Well, first of all, they produce food for people. Many times, sometimes uh, it's for, to sustain the families, other times to get some increased income. And small farms of two acre, hectares or below produce around one third of the world's food in less than 11% of the farmland. So this uh, provides you already uh, a, a big, uh, I would say, picture of, of how important they are for uh, the entire world. We also know that in terms of efficiency, they are much lighter in terms of their footprint on essential ecosystems, as well as, the, as I was mentioning before, the impact in terms of greenhouse host emissions. And uh, I, I, we all can agree that they also preserve biodiversity in a very different way than, than bigger farms. Uh, and many times we are seeing it where it's with indigenous peoples or other communities, they very much work with, with nature. Now we talked in the developed world of regenerative agriculture, but I'm sure uh, when we explain it to many of them, they have been conscious and really knowing about it for centuries. At the same time, uh, we know that, that I was talking before as farming as a business and many times on seeing the generation of income. So we know that productive and profitable small farms work hand in hand with what we call micro and small uh, medium enterprises. And um, Agri-food micro and small medium enterprises provide farmers with vital input where it seeds, fertilizers, and as I was saying before, um, also generating income for the community. And they also perform activities of the farm, such as processing, storing, or, or marketing food. Um, I was before advocating in the, on the importance of what has been happening on the global community, on the underinvestment in small-scale agriculture, but food systems go beyond also uh, agriculture. We know that as long as rural roads are unpaved, as long as villages are without electricity, health clinics or clean water, the food systems will continue to fail us and to fail the people that are being producing this food. We will continue seeing young rural people migrating first to the cities where many times they cannot receive a decent employment or going across neighboring countries or in other cases to other continents. So. This is the reality, and this is what we have been seeing for decades. Unless we change the current investments, whether it's the balance between humanitarian and development, or we attract more private sector into these rural areas, I, I'm sure I will come back in five years and I will just say the same things, which would be very unfortunate. Um, so my, our biggest, I would say, uh, message is that we need to invest very much in these rural areas. We need to provide these small farmers with the ability to lead their lives, to have this initial investment to, to strengthen their resilience. And we know that this is much less costly than many times um, being having to respond to an emergency. I think that we can all agree. There's also research that says that for every dollar that we spend in this type of resilience building, it can save up to $10 in future emergency and humanitarian costs. So the return on investment, the value for money is very clear. We obviously need to continue saving lives and emergency relief, but without this long-term investment resilience, it will just the bill will continue just to con increasing, especially with climate change. And for that, we are all affected. I don't need to tell you about the droughts, the floods. I mean, it's happening in the developing countries, in the low-income countries, but also in all of the developed economies. There could be more fiscal space and ability for governments to support the citizens. At the same time, this is affecting us all. Just like the food crisis, I think, unfortunately, uh, IFAD and the mission receives much more attention when there's a food crisis, when a lot of the citizens and, and just uh, all of us in the developed world see that the food prices are increasing and we are all being affected. And we just inquire, where is this food coming from? Where's the value change? What's happening? But for, for many of the small scale farmers, this is their, their day to day. We have obviously uh, some tools and some solutions a lot of them also are related to digital technologies, where it's just a simple mobile phone, many times to access markets, to access prices. Satellites, in other cases, drones, if, if, if the development journey allows, but there's solutions exactly the same as with financial services. I think financial inclusion, the ability to have savings, to be able to contract many times with, with the supply chain is something that we have seen that very much connects farmers to, to the markets. 
And this is already happening the same as with, we are seeing with renewable energy and, and PV panels, which have become very much cheaper and can be installed locally. As I said, this is not only a job for the government, it's a job for, uh, I would say for all of us, but also for the private sector. And I think uh, being able to attract and mobilize with the right uh, risk return, as well as with the right ecosystem and regulation to the private sector will become more key. When we talk about official development assistance, it's a very, very tiny uh, drop of all the investment. If you think only about remittances, remittances are three to four times bigger, just in terms of ODA. If you think about local private sector, it's many, many, many times bigger than ODA. So it's important that we are aware we don't only talk to ourselves, but actually make sure that we are partnering with many of these institutions and many of these uh, partners. Let me put you some examples, for example, of how IPVAT partners before finalizing. In Rwanda, for example, with, uh, we have uh, partnered with tea private uh, factories where we buy, which buy directly from farmer cooperatives and cooperatives themselves participate as equity shareholders in the factory. And each cooperative has around 4,000 members. Indeed, it has been so successful. I remember when I was in Rwanda that because they also receive dividends, people want to just pay uh, as much as they can to get into the equity because then they receive some dividends. And here we're talking about small scale farmers and smaller families, but it has been a business model that has worked uh, quite well. Or for example, in Nicaragua, where we have been promoting planting trees to shade uh, um, coffee and cocoa crops. And these schemes have sequestered carbon, reduced temperature and enhanced the land productivity of, of many of the farmers. Or in Niger, where we have helped design a program that encourages farmers to plant grasses and trees, restore watersheds, and conserve soil and water. This project has actually produced an increase in yields in the case of onions, cabbages, or tomatoes of up to 40%, and rape, or in the case of rain-fed millet, 78%. So I think this has also, when the right, I would say, integration of climate and food security comes together, there's also ways of increasing productivity in the medium term, which I think there's no other choice. I mean, if we deplete the natural resources, there's for many of them without healthy soil, without access to water, there's actually no agriculture, no generation of income. Um, so um, just uh, I wanted just to end perhaps by reiterating that for us, small scale family farms, it's not only about individual projects, it's about building the ecosystems and building the food systems around them. This is challenging development. It's not a one off intervention. It takes time. It takes us a year to design a program. It takes us five to six years to implement. And our goal is that this transforms the community over time, that it's sustainable when we leave the community is able to generate the income, which is one of the variables that we very much uh, look into. With this, let me finalize. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for being together today. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Lario, for that insightful intervention. Um, we have a number of questions um, to pose, um, but can I ask those who are posing questions to please identify themselves before they um, make the question? Um, I know we have a roving mic here in the room. I'd start in here. Would anyone like to pose a question? Might take two or three together. Uh, just Liam who done I'm a member of the Joe Public. Um, and I heard your talk there and you said that there was 700 million people hungry, 3 billion people that um, are below the uh, food sustenance line, nutrition line, and the rest of us are doing well and okay, thank you very much. And you're saying that there are two hectares per small farmer which will give one third of the annual food provision using 11% of farmland. Now, the United Nations have told us that by 2050, the population of the globe is going to double. So you seem to be walking yourselves into a James Lovelock situation, whereby he states by 2050, there'll be 1 billion people left on the earth. So I want to know what plan you have to make sure that that one third of the uh, two hectares that everybody is using 
when are they going to get four hectares to give 33% of the world food population so that they might be subsized? And whilst the rest of us might have to have half the food, thank you very much, and we'll still survive. Thank you. Um, Michael, I think you had a question. Michael O'Brien from Trocra. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for um, your uh, introductory comments. And I'd like to ask you about the enabling of the food systems transition and the need to both reorient and find additional, mobilize additional uh, investment um, for these sustainable food systems transitions. And in that context, you mentioned the private sector. And so in terms of the private sector's co-financing of transformative food systems based on innovative approaches, such as those based on agroecological principles, IFAD's 2021 stock take of how IFAD is supporting such innovative transitions found negligible finance coming from the private sector. So my question is, two years on from that stock take, do you see any change? And is there, or what is the role of the private sector in complementing the critical public finance that is increasingly supporting the scaling up of such transitions? Thank you. You want to take those two? Yes, for now? yes, yeah. of course. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. Uh, very interesting. Actually, I mean, by 2050, yeah, we're expecting to get to 10 billion, so 2 billion more of population probably uh, from the current 8 billion. Um, the reality is that the issue of hunger and food security is not a matter of food production. I think we know all how to very much produce food in the developed well, developing world. I think it's there's plenty of arable land, as we all know, in Africa. It's a matter, I think, of the investments and the uh, enabling of access many times to, we're talking about, uh, well, uh, first and foremost, I would say mechanization uh, and productivity, but also rural roads. I mean, when we talk about access to markets of many of these small farmers, I was recently in the south of Madagascar, and we can talk theoretically about access to markets. It's one of our focuses. Actually, there's no main road. It's only an unpaved road where actually it's very difficult for them to say, well, we're going to sell, even send our products to the center of the country if there's actually no roads. The EU is actually supporting on constructing right now a paved road, but it goes beyond that. The same with storage. Um, we know, for example, in the 2008 crisis, the international community decided to increase production massively to subsidize seeds. It seems like a good theoretical idea. Next year, a lot of that food went rotten because there was no storage, no distribution, no transportation. So I think without this enabling, I would say investments around there, we will not be able to, to really make that happen. And it's not only the international community, as, as many of you might be aware, there's the Maputo declaration from African countries where they said they would be investing up to 10% of their GDP of agri in, in agriculture. There's only one country who has really gotten close to that. And if you think about them, 50, 60, 70% of their population is in formal or informal roles in agricultural food system. So I think it's the scale of the challenge is huge. And if we only put patches here and there, or we do not look at the compact as, as such of the sectors that we need to involve, it will not change. And it's not about only producing more food in the developed world. It's making the enabling conditions in the developing world and in the low-income countries to be self-sufficient to be even uh, just that, it's not happening in many of the countries right now. So I think the scale of the, of the problem many times is um, the type of investments, as well as we have to recognize what we're talking about, the food system stock taker right now, the reality is that in, there's a massive distortion from the developed world too, in terms of taxes and subsidies. I mean, we're talking to the extent of 500 to 600 billion per year in terms of subsidies and taxation. So we are all part of that. So that's also a reality. We have to acknowledge it and it's, it should be part of the discussion in transforming all of this. So there's, I would say, systemic issues that need to be transformed related to how to relate to each other, as well as the type of investments we do. So uh, my only main point would be that it's, it goes also beyond food production or productivity. There has been a lot of research, a lot of focus on productivity, which is great. 
but productivity, which is an important part, will not solve all of the entire challenge in my view. Um, on the second question on additional instruments on co-financing, any change? Um, it's interesting because um, I see a lot of, uh, and I was discussing it with our colleagues now from Irish Aid before, I see a lot of talk about bringing the private sector. And indeed, we're working with some pension funds uh, where they are thinking about investing 1 billion, which is not huge, but for them, it's an important part of their assets under management to try to tackle some of these issues related to food systems and how we can support them in specific countries with technical assistance and relationship with the government. But um, there's always this talk about, well, there's trillions in the world, anything could be the director. I think that's wishful thinking. That's not the reality of how the world works, how the pension fund works, how the private sector works. So you need to offer really certain ecosystems as well as certain ability for them to generate certain income to attract the, the private sector and be able to make sure that across the value chain, you have very clear ideas of where, when can they come in or you want you set up the ecosystem, the regulations for them to come in. And this is not necessarily happening. I mean, we talk about it, but for us it's, uh, and from our side is how we can really enable and catalyze a lot of that investment not from a theoretical point of view, but actually with investable assets and with uh, making sure in our case and from the mission of our institution that this translates into an impact into the vulnerable community. So that means into the rural people, because you can bring a lot of private sector. And as we know, and it happens in agriculture, a lot of that can be extracted just, for example, through raw materials. And a lot of it can be then uh, commercialized and transformed in the developed world. A lot of African countries, for example, are discussing more and more about what they can do, not obviously only in agriculture, in other sectors, to make sure that a lot of the still the transformation and the value addition is in the country. If you think about Africa, once more, um, they import every year 75 billion in terms of food. I'm pretty sure if all of that investment would be kept in Africa in terms of transformation, commercialization, imagine the number of jobs that could be created and generation of income. It could be massive. But that's part of a bigger picture that, that also requires to think about uh, food sovereignty and local production and the entire ecosystem. And that's where you can think, okay, where, where and how can the private sector come in? So it's uh, at the end of the day, it's about um, the entire system, but uh, making sure that you attract the private sector with specific investable assets that they can be interested in. Just Talking about it will not bring the money. So I think there needs to be a very conscious effort on those policies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've had a couple of questions in online, so I might share them now as well. Um, Keelan O'Sullivan, who's the development researcher here at the IAA, asks, how does EFAD ensure its work and programs are gender responsive? And then another question from Leanne Digney, also a UN researcher here at the IAA, asking about 2023 is the midway point of the agenda 2030. So what are your hopes for where the world will be in 2030 at the end of a sustainable development agenda in terms of food and nutrition security? Well, in terms of gender, uh, we have targets for our programs. Um, I would say there's, and I always mentioned it, but it's very important. It's very different to talk about gender sensitive programs and to talk about gender transformative programs. Gender sensitive is about including women in the program, which is part of it, but that's clearly not enough. Some of our impact assessment, when we measured the results of our programs on the ground, actually show that we have been very effective in terms of increasing the income of many of these women in the programs and for the community, which then has a transformation, as I said before, in terms of nutrition, in terms of schooling, in terms of the family itself. What we have not been effective and we have not been, and this is where the gender transformation comes, and it's much more difficult. It entails social norms, culture is actually on, for example, having women access land and land titles. This provides them with the, many times with the collateral, with the ability of, of making, uh, I would say, uh, of having a sustainable future. And that's much more difficult. And that transformation does not happen as easily because it entails many more conversations, a lot of discussions in the communities, and that's much, much tougher. And, um, and probably as, as, as we know, that requires a longer term also view of, of, of the impact many times of the programs. And there's, you need patient to be patient, patient capital, as well as have specific programs that address 
those areas in, in terms of gender. It's very clear that that's our goal, but it's also clear that it requires a long time and it requires being very conscious. So I would say gender remains one of our, of our key features with the challenges that, that it entails. Um, just to put you an example, recently I was in, an, in, in giving an award to an African woman uh, who had started a business and who was uh, hiring other women and showing other uh, uh, women in the community how to become entrepreneur. And she actually told me on the side, well, actually, all of this is great. She was receiving awards here and there. But she told me, if my husband divorces me, then actually the land belongs to him. So then I have no generation of income. So I'm totally vulnerable to that land title. And that's also a reality of, of what we are currently talking about. Um, in terms of the 2030 agenda, well, for SDG 1 and SDG 2, um, the figures are back to uh, eight years ago. So very clearly, we are not only on track, we are just going the opposite direction. So I cannot be very optimistic from now to 2030. Um, in terms of SDG 2 concretely, and for us, SDG 2.3, which is relates to small scale producers, mm -hmm. I would say that there has been a much more awareness of the importance, as I was saying before, of food sovereignty and the importance of local production. We're seeing some countries increasing their budgets and local governments. However, once more, the scale and the speed at which we need this change is massive, and that I'm not saying. Great. Back out to the floor. Any questions? Let's start with Michelle. Um, thank you, Alvaro. Um, my name is Michelle Winthrop. I'm the Irish ambassador to South Korea and full disclosure, I'm also a member of the executive board of IFAD representing Ireland. Um, with the uh, war in Ukraine, uh, we have slightly lost sight of the impact that COVID-19 had on global food systems. I wonder if you could say a little bit about how that looks from your perspective and, and the extent to which systems have recovered from, from the impact of COVID and uh, what IFAD has been doing to address it. Thank you. Thank you. you have a question there? Hi, good afternoon. I'm Greta Fitzgerald, for, uh, Food Security, Nutrition Policy and Advocacy Advisor with Concern. Um, it's really interesting to hear, um, and I suppose we've been hearing it since around this stock take in 2021, around linking kind of climate finance and the food systems finance and I thought how you've kind of kind of taken the lead on the global food financing architecture that initiative um but recently Oxfam's report on climate finance and kind of digging into the numbers it was kind of surpri not surprising but I suppose alarming to see that about in 2019 of the 66 billion of climate finance 26% of that was grant. The rest then was mixed between concessional, non-concessional loans. So considering like just transition, rural just transition, which you mentioned earlier, realistically, where are we at with that? What is the appetite to start shifting those numbers to more kind of equi equitable proportions? Um, and is there appetite for that, I think, um, in the dis discussions going on? Thanks, Greta. Is there another two more questions over here? I think, and then we'll pass back. Paul Wagstaff from South Africa. I have a macroeconomic question for you. Um, you mentioned uh, local food production, food sovereignty, and food imports. Now, a lot of countries are in Africa are particularly reliant on imported cheap food, particularly rice, to feed the urban poor. Now, this obviously sends a very negative price signal to farmers. It's very difficult to increase rice production, for example, in West Africa, because local farms can't compete with the imported rice. So if you want to build your local rice industry, you need to have higher prices. Higher prices will then mean, to be honest, food rights in the cities. So how do national governments square this particularly difficult circle? There's one more over there. Thank you very much, uh, Adekunle Gomez from the African Culture Project. Um, I will very much identify with that point you made about uh, infrastructure. When I was uh, growing uh, up back in Ghana, the headlines every so often would say food rotting in the farms. And uh, so it's not a question of the <clears throat> food production not uh, taking place, but getting the food from one place 
to another. Now, I think um, the popular saying is that everything comes <coughs> sorry, mm -hmm. <coughs> from the land or to some extent, uh, you know, the sea as well. And um, uh, during your talk, you made a uh, reference to uh, the digital uh, uh, element. Now, uh, recently I came across a book by Joan Baxter. She had lived in uh, uh, seven countries in West Africa uh, for 30 years and traveled to 26 others. And I, her book is such a revelation, but on the topic of food and uh, digital, and she uh, and, uh, wrote about this uh, mineral called root tail. Some of us probably are aware or not, but it is an element uh, which, uh, as she says, uh, is present in practically everything in our household. At the same time, uh, the mining of a uh, root tail in Sierra Leone, um, uh, as she documented, it has resulted in 180,000 acres of what was a uh, thriving agricultural land lost. Uh, also, uh, she wrote about uh, the production of uh, agrofuel for a uh, European um, uh, uh, the, uh, the market. So um, now the question is that we've got the dilemma of depending upon the mineral, our everyday use, which is also resulting in, for example, uh, the loss of uh, farmland. Uh, if I can also make a, a quick comment about the Ukraine situation. Now, everybody is saying, oh, like the war is uh, going to affect uh, uh, food import in Ghana. Now, oh, sorry, not Ghana, Africa, for example. Now, okay, while I, uh, uh, okay, uh, probably should be grateful that people are taking of us, it seems sometimes, you know, somehow that like your uh, uh, farming, uh, uh, your <coughs> neighboring uh, farmer is being killed. And we are worrying about our food source. That would be kind of a, you know, a, a first reaction. Secondly, too, I mean, why should uh, uh, a tropical uh, land depend upon grains from the temperate lands? Now, those who uh, have been studying the um, uh, history of uh, uh, food production in Africa would know that uh, there are drought resistant crops such as millet, sorghum. And these were replaced by the colonial authorities with things like maize. And I mean, uh, uh, fortunately, there are, there, is, there are efforts to uh, 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 bring them back. But anyway, I mean, uh, uh, because of shortage of time, my question is that what can we do to resolve that difficulty of farmlands being lost because we are depending upon those minerals for our everyday um, uh, living. I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And Mr. Spong, no, last one. Sure. Um, Isabel from uh, the Irish League of Credit Unions Foundation. Uh, just a, a kind of a, an adjunct uh, question, comment. Uh, is there any en engagement or um, policy dialogue with the World Trade Organization to address the um, the structural issues which you've alluded to, and I suppose relating also to uh, Paul Wagstaff question as well? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. A lot of uh, very interesting and structural questions. Let me start with the last one, uh, or on in reverse order. Um, so actually, I have been discussing with the executive director with Ngozi about this, and I know she has started some conversations in the last uh, six months about uh, trade uh, negotiations uh, around agriculture. As you know, nothing has changed over the last two decades, and she knows what she's heading into. At the same time, she has started already the conversation. Indeed, she wanted to bring us and FAO into the conversation. We are supporting some of the of the programs there, um, I mean, of the of the current uh, background papers and so on. But this has started. Where they will conclude very soon, that I'm not very sure. But clearly, at least there's the impulse to to have those negotiations. In terms of the um, fourth question on, uh, well, there was a number of questions on agrifuel, loss of farmland, and also on replacement of of grains and crops. I think this, starting with the last part, 
This is one of the issues that we advocate for. As you said, there has been a lot of substitution of crops that are not natural to the farmland, that are less nutritious in many cases. And this is some of the things that we try to advise and work with the governments themselves to bring back a diversification of crops, as well as making sure that there's not that dependency. But I ask myself the same questions that you have asked yourself in terms of, um, I would say, how can it be possible that we depend on on such, I would say, external factors or countries to many times feed the population. So there's more and more of that thinking. In some cases, like for example, in South Asia, there's sometimes a cultural issue with relate to, for example, to rice production, a variety of rice and so on. Um, but generally, other times it has been because of the historical background of the country, as you said, on substitution, there's always some background. But for us, it's very important that we go to more nutritious crop, to more diversification of crops, and that's why we try to also promote in our in our projects with the with the governments on the farmlands. This reminds me, I recently in the summit Paris, there was a I'm not going to say the country, but let's say the main uh, an entrepreneur businesswoman who actually was uh, telling me where she was the biggest I would say owner of uh, gold and minerals extraction in the count of in one country, and she was telling me how she was trying to promote I don't know if this is real or not, but she was trying to promote with the government regulations that whenever the land was acquired that still once the extraction had happened and so on still the the small scale producers could very much. Uh, uh, have a living in the land afterwards or in a neighboring land or have swapped lands. But I think that's clearly one issue that a lot of African countries go through. I don't have an answer to that. Um, perhaps on the loss of farmland due to uh, reforestation or, or, or things like that, there's business model that, that we do by which we incentivize many of the farmers to grow the trees, giving them some land. And as the trees grow, uh, we provide them more land and at the end of the day we we manage some reforestation so that has worked for example in kenya i visited uh, one project like that as long as the incentives also for the farmers are there to generate the income in the case of extraction probably depends very much on each country i'm, I'm not very familiar I, I just was discussing with this businesswoman how she was lobbying the government to really support them but i think that's probably a very very uh, important discussion so the third question in terms of squaring the, the, the circle with respect to prices and inputs um, and import substitution once more and exports. I think the key issue many times is to very much for us to increase local production and increase locally diversified crops and increase integration of regional markets. So that's a little bit of our way to try to tackle this issue. We know it's a very challenging one. At the same time, without this type of focus or investment, the current status quo will not change. So it's very clear that we need to, to address it somehow. And these are our three responses there. On the question on the climate and food financing and grant versus loans, real just transition. I think that's the big question right now. I mean, many of my meetings with presidents in Africa, actually we discuss five, 10 minutes about food security and rural areas, and then they shift directly to climate financing, climate adaptation. There's a lot of issues related to that. Many of them have designed actually just energy transition programs, but they cannot finance them. So um, the question you just mentioned in terms of grant and loans, I think this is not really being discussed at the international level. I mean, we're discussing the reform of the financial international architecture, but the reality is that grants cannot be multiplied. They do not come back. So um, how to create a, a mechanism that would work? We have thought for example, I think the, the current plan of Ecuador and a debt for nature swap is interesting, it's good, it solves a small issue, but it does not tackle the entire, obviously, challenge. And I do not have an answer for that. I think the current mechanisms that are being proposed are not enough to address the grant versus loan. We know many of the low-income countries are highly indebted, so actually they cannot receive any more loans. Or the, we could talk about the composition of their debt and so on. There's many nuances there, but the grant versus loan issue, I think it has not, it's not being really addressed or tackled. And I don't know if there's an, an easy, uh, even one innovative solution that we thought on the international community, which is the rechanneling of special drawing rights, does not seem to have uh, fully worked or has not provided the fiscal space we were thinking it would provide. So I think there needs to be a, a continuation of, of the focus, as you mentioned, on that. Debt relief could be part of it. Obviously, a debt common framework that actually works and provides equal treatment with private creditors. I think there's advance on that. 
I mean, to, to put a little bit of a hope or a positive note, the reality is that one year ago, we were not discussing debt relief. We were not discussing reform of financial architecture. We were not discussing uh, really climate financing commitments. So I think we're in the good track, but obviously we are not where we should be. Um, on the last question on the COVID impact, I think one of the issues that we saw during COVID was that remittances would be much more affected. We were expecting a 10 to 20% decrease. At the end, I think it was a single figure decrease. So it, uh, remittances, which are, as I said before, is a big financing mechanism, did not get as impacted as we thought. In our programs, what we realized, we put together a, a rural stimulus facility to attend some of the, well, in this case, through e-vouchers, to a number of different ways of trying to support uh, small-scale farmers in the short term. We realized that many of our programs need to be more responsive in the short term. As I said, many of our programs are for five, six years, long-term development, but there's a lot of more shocks we're seeing. We're seeing climate shock, we're seeing income shock, inflation shock, shocks, a lot of things that uh, actually the world is becoming more volatile and more vulnerable. So that's what we really learned throughout the crisis, that our programs need to be more responsive also and, and adjust uh, equally to, to some of these issues. We also put a crisis response initiatives so I think we, after Ukraine, so so we have learned somehow to adjust as much as we can with many of these shocks. Thank you. Thank you, President Lario. I mean, I just have a question from my side. I mean, as we've mentioned, Ireland is particularly invested in malnutrition and child wasting. Um, can you tell us more about IFAD's ambitions or plans in this space? Um, so thank you very much. Um, I think for us, uh, everything starts, so to say, with the ability, as I said, to afford a healthy diet. So if you cannot afford it because your income is not enough, uh, that's already a problem. We're talking about 3 billion people in the world. So that's uh, clearly a, a, a huge challenge. For us, in many of the low-income countries and countries affected by fragility, this starts with providing uh, small farmers and small-scale producers with the ability to to generate that income that provides them with, with enough nutrition. The second part, obviously, is capacity building and awareness. As uh, some of you pointed out before, we're seeing an increased, uh, I would say, in, in many countries, an increased uh, consumption of imported junk food. And that's also a reality in many of, of these countries. You have to also understand that for them, it's a, it's not only the food itself, it's a luxurious item that they somehow reflect culturally as, a, as a, something coming from the developed world. But it's true that we are also having programs with the communities of women whereby we stress the importance of locally grown food, of nutritious food, and it all starts with education. So I think this both the capacity building as well as having the income to afford nutrition are an important part of how we respond to this. Thank you. Are there any more questions from the floor? Congratulations on all of the innovation that you've been showing in IFAD. I think that you set a great standard for multilateral organizations, you personally. And uh, in my experience of IFAD, you are very progressive in how you see more sustainable solutions, blended finance, etc. And you have signed the master accreditation agreement with the Green Climate Fund. And I'm wondering to what extent you see carbon finance as an opportunity to create a new asset class mm -hmm. that can draw in private sector co-investment and address some of the kind of uh, critical gaps in rural services, energy, water, forestry, et cetera. Uh, what, what are your plans in relation to mm -hmm. that agreement? Thank you. So that's a, a great question. We actually, I was sharing before with some colleagues that we have a one and a half billion pipeline with climate funds. And an important part of this is with Green Climate Fund, which allows us also to provide some innovative projects and look into them, specifically on carbon finance. For me as a development finance executive, I think it always has, a, I mean, finance is always to me part of the means to an end and part of the solution. And I think, uh, Carbon credits, to me, we're in the infancy. We have gone already through a decade probably on that. and um, But still, there's a lot of things, and we have seen it in recent reports, that we still need to make sure that they are responding to the needs. And for us at IFAD, where I'm sitting right now, they need to respond to the needs of small-scale producers and, and very much rural people. And many times that translation 
into how they benefit from this, not the financial institutions, the trading, the countries, the macro, how it translates is very important. We have, to the extent to my knowledge, of my knowledge, we have two programs actually where we are looking into ecosystem payments in two countries uh, related to uh, carbon offset by small scale producers on voluntary basis. And we're pioneering and trying to pilot that to see how much it can be scaled. So I think for us, it's potentially part of the solution. How important it can be in the future is difficult to determine. But as with the debt for nature or carbon finance or carbon offsetting or CO2 trading, I think we just need to be creative because it's clear we were talking before about grants and loans. I mean, it's not enough. The current situation, status quo, is not acceptable. So we need to find new ways from our side. Those new ways need to benefit the small scale producers. And that's what we are very much looking for. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I think we're going to have to draw things to a close. Um, but can I say thank you very much to the audience here in the room for your engagement and, and indeed to all of you online as well. Thank you very much to the IAEA for hosting us here today. And thank you to you, President Lario, for a really insightful talk and a, and a really interesting discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.